You know, last year was the first of three years that uh, Pastor Greg implemented this vision to reach out with the gospel beyond the location where their actual crusade is taking place. And um, they had about 300,000 people that tuned in across the United States, if you can imagine that. Most crusade venues will hold anywhere approximately 50,000 people or so. And so with the use of technology, uh, churches like ours became what are called host churches, and consequently, in addition to the 50,000 people that heard the message that was preached, there were another 250,000 who heard it. So. The idea is that on the 29th of September, what we're going to do here is have a family night free barbecue. In your bulletin, there's a little uh, card there that talks about praying. If you'll pull that card out with me for just a moment, um, you'll notice it says, pray, 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 and it lists there of the items specifically to pray for. And I'll be talking more with you about prayer in just a few moments. But on the back, it says, write down the names of five people you want to see come into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It could be a family member, a friend, a neighbor, a co-worker, or someone else. And then down below that in the blue part, it says, pray for an opportunity to invite them. Pray that their hearts will be prepared for the gospel and pray that they will say yes to the invitation to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But then the last two are very important also. Not only invite uh, them, whom will you invite? Pray for them and invite them, but then bring them. Don't come alone. Ask them if you can bring them. Most people who respond to the invitation are brought by a friend. The Billy Graham organization and... Um, uh, Harvest Crusade, which has ministered to over four and a half million people over the last 20 years, uh, they've, in their analysis, understood that the predominant uh, majority up in the 90 percentile range of those who respond to the evangelistic message were actually brought to the event by a friend rather than them just showing up because they heard about it or saw a poster. So, uh, you have this treasure, Jesus Christ, within you. You have access to God through prayer. You are aligning yourself with the will of God when you begin to pray for somebody to be saved. Paul the Apostle said in the book of Romans in chapter 10, he said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So we want to begin to pray for the people that we know need the Lord. Uh, the treasure that you have uh, can't be valued. What would a man give in exchange for his soul? So let's pray for ourselves that we have the power of the Holy Spirit, that we are compelled by the love of God to reach out. You know, statistics also indicate, and this is a sad thing that I'm going to tell you, but I believe it's true, one of the primary reasons that most Christians don't involve themselves in any kind of evangelism, and I might ask you, what, what do you think it might be? You might say, well, I'm kind of afraid to, you know, say something. Well, that's very legitimate. But I personally believe there's a, uh, a higher reason, which is sad but true, and that is that people just, Christians, just actually don't care enough to actually reach out. And so Paul the Apostle said he felt constrained. He was constrained by God's love, not because he was some great Christian, but because of the love of God working within him. So I thank God that I am saved and I'm not going to hell. I thank God that I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. And I thank God if you're saved that you and I are going to be together, that you won't be in the lake of fire and I know that you and I as saved people have this treasure of the gospel within, and you and I both know that God uses people. I have a beautiful dog at home, but that dog isn't going to save anybody. Uh, God uses people to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. So 
Um, what we're going to do is in, it's like it's as if we're having a crusade right here. You pray for your friends and pray for them, pray for the crusade, um, invite them, bring them, and come and enjoy a free dinner. It starts at 4.30, and then at 5.30 the event, which will be uh, actually transpiring in Philadelphia, will be broadcast here, and we'll be able to enjoy some of the worship music and then hear an evangelistic message by Pastor Greg Laurie, and we'll see people respond to that message and get saved. So please keep that in mind. We'll be talking with you more about it. I know this is probably the first time we've really tried to underscore what it is, but one of the marks of a healthy Christian is that they're not stagnant. They don't just take in. In fact, you know, up in, the, in Israel that you have up in the northern part, the Sea of Galilee, and down at its southernmost portion of the Sea of Galilee, there's an outlet, and it becomes then the River Jordan, and that water flows down that way. When you have a body of water that has an inflow of water, but it has nowhere to go, what happens is called stagnation. Um, and uh, that's not some kind of new dance, the stagnation, but uh, it sounds like it ought to be some kind of a dance or something. But what happens is Christians can be so, they just take in, take in, take in, and they become bored, they become stagnant. But when you receive the Word of God, you respond, you understand the Word of God, and you respond to the Word of God, uh, tran transformation, change takes place in your life. And if you have an outlet to share your faith with other people, it is one of the most exciting, uh, invigorating aspects of the Christian life. It will do you more good than you could even imagine to reach out and talk to a person about Christ, help them come to Christ, help disciple them. There's a, a beautiful, it's not a vicious cycle, it's a blessed cycle of being able to give out what God has given to you someone, God used someone to do that for you. And so I pray that we as a church will be a, a, a full-bodied, full mature, loving church that we want to proclaim the gospel, especially in the, these last days. And may I just say that the events of this last week, our governor, Governor Jerry Brown, signing this most incredible uh, bill that is beyond belief, uh, this transgender bill, uh, there ought to be a sharp awakening taking place in our lives. Uh, just a month or so ago, the Supreme Court made a ruling that now makes it legal for people of opposite sexes to be married, uh, reversing really the thought of uh, what the voters had expressed here in the state of California. Uh, these are things that are going on around us. Now, uh, the church is not here as a political entity. We have something greater than that. That's called building up the kingdom of God in these last days. And Jesus said to occupy while, while we wait for him and to work while it is yet day redeeming the time. So um, these are sobering days that we're living in. And uh, if you're not shocked by the things that are crumbling around you, I don't know what it will take to shock you, but it's sobering to me. And Peter said in his first epistle, he said to be sober, knowing that these are the last days. Jesus Christ is coming. So um, uh, we pray that God will bless and he'll use us to share the good news of Jesus Christ with as many people as we can. And, uh, you know, most of you, oh, I could go on and you're saying, please don't. But uh, some of you are saying, please do, but I'm going to switch gears. This is Paul and Marilyn Castle. You can hardly see Marilyn because she's uh, so short. So I'm going to come over this way so you can see her. If she came over here, you'd only see the three of us. So uh, she may be short, but don't mess with her, I can tell you that. She's in charge of what's going on around here. Paul and Marilyn are starting a home Bible study. And uh, that information should be in your bulletin. I'm not quite sure when it's going to be starting up, but I just wanted to let you know who they were. We want to lay hands on them and affirm our belief that God's hand is upon them and encourage them. So if you'll stand, please. Their interest in a home Bible study 
is to help make disciples of Jesus Christ and to uh, care for one another, be cared for, and to encourage personal growth in Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the love of God that you've expressed in Jesus coming to the cross. We thank you for that love that has found its way into these two hearts over many, many, many years. We thank you, Father, for their current involvement in serving you as they wait for the return of Jesus Christ. And now, Lord, in this additional venture of faith, we pray, Lord, your hand, your blessing, as they seek to share the truth of God's word in a gracious, humble, loving way, helping others to know and follow Christ. Bless them, fill them, baptize them afresh with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you guys. Watch your step, please, as you head down. At the end of the service today, I want to share and give an invitation, a gospel invitation message myself, and I particularly um, would like to, if you'll give me just a moment here, I particularly would like to uh, try and mention, speak to you, those of you here this morning, that your lives, rather than being marked by uh, peace, you're marked by fear, especially the fear of dying. Uh, you can be certain that you are going to die. That's going to happen to you. That will help happen and um, unless the rapture of the church comes. And so many of you, I know, have a fear of dying, both Christians and non-Christians. And at the end of the service this morning, I'd like to take a few moments and address God's antidote and remedy for that fear. Um, if you will open your bulletins with me, please. Um, you'll notice that in the bulletins are, um, there's a sheet there marked, prayer requests taken from Luke chapter 2, verse 39 through 51. And uh, you'll notice that below each of the numbers, there's one, two, three, and then four, five, six. You'll notice that below each of the numbers and the little paragraph, there are scriptures. And the reason there are scriptures there is that the scriptures are to validate that what we're praying for is actually scriptural. The Bible teaches us that if our prayers are lined up with the Word of God, there's a couple of things that we can be sure of. Number one, we know that he hears us. If we pray anything according to his will, 1 John chapter 5 says, we know that he hears us. And secondly, if we know that he hears us, we know that we have the petitions that we have desired of him. And so Jesus, when he was asked, could you teach us to pray? He said, pray in this manner, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So one of the principles of prayer is that we're not seeking to get God to do our will, but rather for God to do his will, which is revealed to us in the Bible. So what I do on Sundays when I go home, I'll do it this afternoon, is I take my computer and I go back over the message that I'm going to share with you in a few moments from Luke chapter 3, and I try to extract points that I think are points that we can pray for over the next week. So these are prayer points taken from last week's message. And one of my personal goals is to help us as a church uh, participate in those activities that are part of what a, a healthy church is. You know, when you're looking for a healthy church, you needn't look any further than the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 42, because in that particular verse, you have the four activities of the first church, prayer, fellowship, uh, the apostles' doctrine, and worship, breaking of bread, keeping the Lord first. So we want to encourage you to be Bible readers. We've been talking to you about that. We want to encourage you to be fellowshippers, where you, that sounds cool, fellowshippers, not people out on boats, but people who are sharing their lives. Uh, we want to encourage you to, to grow from being an attender to sharing and being a fellowshipper because that's how, part of how you grow. 
also worshiping the Lord, not only in singing, but in your activities and your giving and so on and so forth. But then one of them is prayer. The early church continued steadfastly in prayer. So, for example, if you'll look with me, number two here. What I'm going to do is pray this out loud, and I'd like to ask that you repeat the prayer after me so we can, as a congregation, pray. So I'm going to begin. Let's pray for the lost or the unsaved in our church. Please go ahead and say that. To be saved and thus forgiven of their guilt from sin. God is the God who forgives all of our sins. When we turn to him in genuine faith and repentance. How about number three? Let's pray that our families follow the good example of being godly and seeking to influence their children in the ways of the Lord. Number six on the back side. One last request to pray for this week. Go ahead. Let's pray for all of the parents in our body who really do not know where their children are or what their children are up to. There are many broken and shattered families. God can restore, God can heal. God can reconcile. God can do anything. In fact, nothing is too hard for the Lord. Father, this is our prayer, that you would move as only you can to bring about love in families where it has vanished and where hate and distance exist. If you can do the impossible, which we know you can, then there is a lot to do. For there is much hurt in so many lives. We pray for your blessing, Lord, in Jesus' name. If you'll turn with me, please, to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, I'd like to share with you one of the other uh, things that we're encouraging you to be committed to. And uh, the reason we're talking about commitment so much these days is because commitment, which means, by the way, uh, it means to carry through to, accomplish, to completion. It's, it's when you accomplish something. That's what it means to commit. And we've been encouraging you to commit yourself to be Bible readers. Let me ask you, do you read the Bible during the week? I want to encourage you to read it. Be a Bible reader. You're, it'll do you good. I want, to com want you to commit to pray. Uh, one of the hardest things to do, but we've last week, last couple of weeks spoke to you then also about making a commitment to be an obedient Christian, to follow the Word of God. And then we've talked with you about committing to being a worshiper. Uh, this morning I want to take a few moments to talk with you about committing to be a giver, generously, faithfully, and joyfully to the work of God's kingdom. You'll notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, it says this, So let each one, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, uh, generosity, of course, is one of God's characteristics. Um, faithfulness uh, is one of God's characteristics. But I want to draw your attention to that word, uh, cheerful. It actually means hilariously. When you're giving the way that God wants you to give, it's actually, it's, you're so joyful. It's a joyful thing. Let me read the verse to you again. 
So let each one, of you, each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. You know, as hard as it was for Jesus to separate himself from the Father, it's, it's so clear that when the Father and the Son decided in the Holy Spirit to send Jesus to actually die for your cross, uh, for your sins, uh, to die on the cross for your sins. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, he went to the cross for the joy that was set before him. Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. So I'm encouraging you. Uh, maybe some of you are tithers, but you've lost the joy of giving. It's just become routine. Ask the Lord to put that joy back in your heart. And if some of you are struggling with well, I don't know if I can really do this, if I want to do it, uh, then don't, because God doesn't want you to give it grudgingly. But I would encourage you, you pray for God to change your heart, and you know what he'll do? He'll slowly peel away your fingers from being, uh, really it's the fingers of your heart that are wrapped around your possessions, and you're holding on to them so tightly that your possessions possess you. What should possess you is the Lord. He should possess you. Otherwise, you're involved in idolatry. Idolatry is any time you let anything take the place of God within your life. And so there's a tremendous freedom in recognizing that God owns everything that we have. And then when you get to that place where you're able to give with joy, it's a joyful, joyful experience. You actually are... It's, you're joyful. <laughs> you're just happy to be able to be a giver. And so we want to encourage you. You commit to read the Bible. You commit to pray. You commit to worship. You commit to be obedient. And you commit to be a giver. And I've got about six others that I'll talk with you over the next six weeks. So don't you get mad at your pastor for asking you to commit to be a godly person. If you do, you need to commit to get your attitude changed, okay? Because I'm just telling you what the Bible has to say. Well, let's uh, learn, turn now, please, to the Gospel of Luke, where we are this morning, chapter 3, Luke chapter 3. And if you'll stand to your feet with me, please, I'd appreciate that. Luke chapter 3. I did want to welcome you if you happen to be visiting with us for the first time this morning. And I also want to welcome the tens of millions that are uh, watching by way of the internet. Uh, it's just amazing to me how many there are. Uh, we get reports, it's tens upon tens of millions that have tuned in, and uh, we thank God for that. So your pastor is lying there. So you might say, Pastor, you need to commit to telling the truth. But we do have an internet congregation, and uh, we welcome them. Uh, by the way, I want to just very quickly encourage those of you who've made recent commitments to follow Christ, you keep it up. You keep it up. And uh, God bless you, Larry, back there on the way back. I see you. Luke chapter 3. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, Herod, being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Latura, excuse me, Ituria, and the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of, the, of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low, and the crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then he said to the multitude that came out to be baptized by him, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, 
we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And by the way, for the rest of this from 10 through 22, what I'd like to do is I'm going to read the even numbered verse out loud. If you guys will read the odd number verses, okay? I'm, te- I'm reading from the New King James. This is something I wanted to do with you. So let me just read verse 10. So the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? And then you guys, verse 11. You can see why you need the New King James. Then tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, And what shall we do? So he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. John answered, saying to them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And with many other exhortations, he preached to the people. Also added this above all, that he shut John up in prison. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. And by the way, you can see from verse 23 through 38, it's a bunch of names. We're going to give you a break on that next week, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for just the joy of all of the things that we've talked about and the worship that we've been able to do by way of singing We pray for those who are deathly afraid of death itself and and live in fear of perhaps some other matter. We pray for those who are unsaved in our congregation this morning, that you would bring them to salvation. We pray for those who are saved, that you might bring any out of being lukewarm or backslidden. We pray, Lord, that you might help each of us to become growers in our relationship with Christ. And that you would help us to be disciples of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Luke was a stickler for detail. He was a doctor, kept good records. If you went into his office, he'd have all those files with all that information. But it's believed that he interviewed so many people and he gathered all the information and he put it together in a very orderly manner. And so thus the Gospel of Luke includes things like giving us the date of when this happened, the 15th year, giving us the person who was the leader of Rome, Tiberius Caesar, and then moving down into Israel itself. Remember, Rome was the, the Romans were the leaders of the world. They also had conquered and were the oppressors of Israel and had instituted their own leadership all through the nation. Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judea down in the southern area. Herod was one of the leaders also up in the northern area of Galilee. His brother Philip was in an area called Ituria and the region of Trachonitis and Lysanias, uh, whom we know little about, was the tetrarch of Abilene. Now, Without, and then you'll notice in verse 2, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests. Um, without going out, taking the time to go into the, the factual background of these people, let me just say this. They were corrupt. 
They were corrupt leaders. These were dark days in the nation of Israel. In fact, normally there would be one high priest, but because Rome was unhappy with uh, the, uh, the high priest, uh, who, which was Caiaphas, or excuse me, was Annas, um, they didn't like the way he was handling things, so they put in uh, they put in this other high priest. So they were meddling around with the religious society of Israel. They were uh, putting their fingers into places that didn't belong. And it was a dark, dark, dark time during the nation of Israel. One of the other dark, one of the other realities of the darkness was that, as you've learned from Matthew and Mark, the religious leaders themselves were corrupt. They were like wolves in sheep's clothing. In fact, the message that the religious leaders were preaching was a message that would make someone twofold more the child of hell. They weren't telling the gospel truth to people. They were telling a false message. And then furthermore, there were, it had been 400 years since the last prophet, which had been Malachi. You know, God had dealt with his nation of Israel for hundreds of years by sending the prophets, but at the end there with Malachi, that was the last one. And so for 400 years, it was silence. God was not at work within the nation. They had so rejected him, they had been left to themselves. But you'll notice out of that darkness and in this corruption and out of that silence, notice in verse 2 what it says, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. So we remember when Zacharias was in the temple and his wife, she was old, and the angel came and told them they were going to have a child and they would call his name John. Well, John is now somewhere up probably about uh, 28 years old or so, and while he actually should have been involved in priestly duties because he was of that family of Zacharias, for reasons that are not mentioned, he went out into the wilderness. And he was out there in the wilderness, and God was dealing with him. God was preparing him. And just like we're told in the Old Testament prophets, over and over, God, it would say like Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Jeremiah, Malachi, Joel, Hosea, Jonah, Zechariah, Zechariah, uh, Hosea, uh, and several others, it would always say the word of the Lord came to that prophet. And uh, we're not told exactly how the word of the Lord came to them, but we're told that God spoke to them. And so here is John the Baptist, and we're told in verse 2, the word of God came to John. Now, we're going to hear what that word was in just a moment. But the second thing you'll notice is that it came to John while he was in the wilderness. God had had him out in a pretty difficult location. You can imagine, not very comfortable. You may be out in a difficult part of your life right now as well. You may feel like you're in the wilderness. You may feel like God has been silent to you, that there's been no activity going on from heaven into your life. And that is oftentimes the way it is with Christians. God is at work, even though he isn't necessarily speaking to you. He has ways that are beyond our ability to understand. But also be encouraged that in those quiet, dark times that all of a sudden, or over a period of time that seems all of a sudden, God can speak to you. The word of the Lord can come to you. In fact, the word of God is coming to you right now this morning, right here from the Bible. And if you're listening, uh, God will speak to your heart. In fact, one of the things that uh, God often says to his people is, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So the decision, uh, you can hear physically, but God wants you to hear spiritually. So uh, the word of God came to John while he was there in the wilderness. And then you'll notice in verse 3, it says, 
And he went into all the region around Jordan, the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, what he did was he responded to the word of God. God spoke to him, and as we're going to see, God told him to go to this certain area and to begin preaching, and he did. He moved from the wilderness area, and he went up around the Jordan, and he began to preach, and his message, we begin to see a part of it here, it was a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. But let me just point out very quickly, John was not a deceived person like many Christians are today. Do you know many Christians are deceived? John was a man who heard the word of God, and then he did what God told him. The Bible says that a person is deceived if they hear the word of God, but they don't respond. You're like a person looking in a mirror, you see what's there, but if you don't respond, you go away and you soon forget what you saw. When God reveals truth to you, it's designed to help you to conform you into the image of Christ. God's thoughts towards you are not evil but good to give you an expected end and a hope. So he speaks to you, he reveals to you the things that he wants you to know, but he doesn't just reveal them to your intellect so that you can say, oh, well, I know this and that about God. He's revealing the truth that is alive, the truth that will transform your life if it is connected with a obedient response. So many Christians hear the word of God, but they don't respond to it. I've been there. You may be there. You may have been there. I'm sure you have. But John is an example for us to take as a good example. He, the word of the Lord came to him. He'd been waiting. And he went and he did what God told him to do. Now, if I were to ask you today, are you doing what God has called you to do? What would your answer be? Would it be, well, kind of, or I'm, I'm hoping to, or I'm planning on it, or I'm partially doing it, or I don't know what he wants me to do, or flat out you might say, no, I'm not doing what he wants me to do. But you ought to be doing what he wants you to do. God is your shepherd. He wants to lead you in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. He wants you to enjoy being by the still waters. He wants to have you lie down in green pastures. He wants to restore your soul. And the thing is, God has all kinds of plans for you, but you have to get, <laughs> you have to get going with him, you know. Uh, it's, you, if you take the first step, then good. Now you can take the second step, and who knows the things that he has, five, six, and eight steps. But if you don't start, you can't get to where God wants you to go. So I want to encourage you to do what God tells you to do. I want to be that way in my own life. Well, please notice in verse 3 what his message was. He was preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, let me be clear. This is different than Christian baptism. What this was, and in the Jewish mind, baptism was a sign of wanting to be cleansed. And so what John was saying is, look, I want you to come and be baptized, and I want your baptism to signify that you're actually having a change of heart, a hearty amending of your ways. In other words, John was saying to the people, from your heart, I want you to start amending your ways. I want you to begin changing your ways. And I want you to look at what you've done with an abhorrence and realize that what you've done in the past is wrong. And I want you to do this because it's in preparation to be forgiven of your sins. Jesus is coming. Remember, John was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. And so in John's ministry, he was trying to prepare the people to get ready to be forgiven of their sins. And part of being forgiven, part of coming to Christ is having faith and having repentance, which is a turning away from sin. You know, when you repent and you turn to God, 
you are also turning away from something. And the people had been living lives that were sinful, so he says, turn away from your sinful life and turn away to God and show that you're turning to God by being baptized. Now, the difference between that baptism and ours is this was a baptism to get ready to be forgiven. When we baptize people, we're saying, you're getting baptized because you have been forgiven. So, difference there, but repentance and the forgiveness of sins are corollaries that kind of go over. Well, verse 4 tells us, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight, every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low, and the crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Now here we have a quote from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, where it was prophesied hundreds of years earlier that John the Baptist would appear on the scene. And so there was a scriptural basis for the ministry that John the Baptist had. And in our walks with the Lord, we need to have a, always have a scriptural basis for the things that we're doing. In other words, John was in the will of God. God had prophesied and planned for him to do this. But it's interesting that what is being said here was also something that was said in the secular world. Uh, Jerusalem was an important location for Rome. And they would have kings and dignitaries who would come. And whenever a king or a dignitary would come, the citizens of that area would get their, their brooms out and get their shovels out and their rakes and their paint, and they'd start making everything ready because, what, the king is coming. Um, if a big dignitary were to come to visit, let's say the Queen of England were to come to Visalia, or Pixley, for example. I mean, let's... Uh, let's Okay, let's, we'll, we'll just stay with Visalia then, okay. If she were to come to Visalia, what we would do is we'd spruce up the city, wouldn't we? We'd make sure that the road she's going to come on has no potholes. We'd clean all the debris off the sides of the road. We'd make, make everything ready. In other words, you've got somebody important coming. You Pixleyites, oh, I'm praying for you. Forgive me, that's my prayer. Forgive me, oh God. But... Uh, the king was coming. And so not only was there a physical preparation that took place, but John was not really talking about let's get the debris off the side of the roads and fix things up. He was talking about preparing your heart because the king is coming. And so there's always a preparation in the heart of a person for the Lord to make his way into their heart. Salvation is a gift, but man has a part in responding to the grace of God. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And there's some interesting symbolism here. First of all, it's prepare the way of the Lord. The way of the Lord is to come into your life. That's what he wants. And so it's you need to prepare your heart for the Lord to enter into your heart. Then make his paths straight. In other words, uh, straighten out your life. Straighten out the road that he's going to go on because our lives can become crooked, as he's going to say. So begin to straighten out your life. Jesus wants to come to you. Every valley shall be filled. Uh, they would, you know, fill in the potholes. You may have sunk to a low in your life. You may be down low because of sin in your life. You may be down low. Uh, it's just your life has brought you lower than you could have ever imagined. Guess what? God wants to fill that lowness up. He wants to bring you up out of the depths of where you have been. Every mountain will be brought low. The, the obstacles, they would be shaved down and flattened out. Sometimes it's people are not only... Uh, trapped in the lowness of where they've found themselves, a, but also then there's the problem of pride. 
and pride needs to be shaved off and pride needs to be uh, made straightened out. So every mountain and hill brought low, humble yourselves. And then the crooked places shall be made straight. In other words, if you will prepare your heart for God, as crooked as your life may have gotten, you may not be a crook, but your life is crooked. It's all messed up. It's, it's going the wrong way. The crooked places will be made straight. It's not by you making them straight. God will make your life straight. He'll take a crooked life that's been made crooked and he'll straighten it out and the rough ways made smooth. You know, our lives can be so rough, sometimes it's just the trials that God allows in our lives that make it rough going, but sometimes we're the ones, because of the way we've acted, we're bearing the consequences of our actions, and our road is a rough road to go. Well, God says he'll make those rough roads smooth, and also many of us, we have rough areas of our life that need to be sanded down and changed. So get ready, John was saying. Come and show that you're serious about your sin, that you want to turn away from it, that you abhor what you've been doing, and make ready your heart. The king is coming. He wants to change your life. Remember, it was a baptism for the remission of sins. Sin is what causes all these problems. Jesus is the problem solver by removing sin, taking sin, paying for sin. Well, then in verse 7, he said to the multitudes, he just turned to the multitudes. Now, can just try to imagine uh, if you were a minister, if you would open up your message by what John said in verse 7. Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, brood of vipers. He just called them a uh, offspring of snakes. Imagine speaking to people that way. Why do you think he did call them that? Because that's what they were. They had become a brood of vipers. They were the offspring of the devil, who is the, 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 the serpent of serpents, if you will. And these were the offspring of Satan. You're either the child of God or you're the child of the devil. So John gave what you might call a bare-knuckled message. He took the gloves off and he just said, let me tell you the truth. You're a brood of vipers. But then he asked them this question. He said, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? This was another sobering part of a message that needed to be heard. He, he asked them this question, who told you to run because of the judgment that was coming? His message was very sobering and very clear. There is a day of judgment coming. And there, there's hope in his, this because he's saying, look, even though you're a brood of vipers, you can run from what you are to Christ and you can escape the wrath of God that is coming upon this world. That's part of the good news of the gospel. You can be saved from the judgment that's coming. Now, it's up to you if you want to flee judgment and run to Christ, or if you want to just keep going the way you are and run smack dab into the middle of the judgment of God. You'll stand before the great white throne judgment, and you'll wind up in a place called the lake of fire. So, John the Baptist was no mamby-pamby, watered-down, light-type preaching gospel guy uh, or trying to not offend anybody by not saying things like wrath and hell and judgment and sin and repentance. He just taught it the way that it should be taught. And you'll find that Jesus did the same thing and Peter did the same thing. And may we stick with what the Bible says. So then in verse 8, he says, look, in light of who you are, and in light of what's coming, he says, here's what you need to do. You need to repent. And he said in verse 8, therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. In other words, uh, what he was saying to them was, bear fruits that are deserving and consistent with your repentance. That is, conduct worthy of a heart 
changed, a heart abhorring sin. So let there be real evidence of the fact that you are truly, truly repenting. Real repentance bears fruit. It ends up seen on the surface. If your attitude has changed, your actions will prove it. And again, there are many Christians who say they are Christians, but their actions don't me measure up. They've not really, it's not really shown up in the way that they live. In other words, they come to church, they go through the motions, they hear the Word of God, but when they leave here, the way that they live is no different than the way they lived before they came here and before they ever even heard the gospel. You'd have to question whether that person is even a Christian or not. So he was saying, look, get serious about this and show that you really are repenting. Then he warned them of a problem that religious people have, and that is found in the middle part of verse 8. He says, and do not begin to say to yourself. So he's saying, now look, don't, don't say this. Well, we have Abraham as our father. In other words, we're Jews. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. One of the problems the people had was because they thought, because they knew they were Israelites, they, and they knew that that was God's special people, they just thought everything was okay. It would be like many people today. They say, well, I'm an American, therefore I'm a Christian. You know, don't, don't let your ethnicity or your uh, nationalistic ethnicity or your spiritual ethnicity, you've been in a family with Christians, just because your family is Christians doesn't mean that you are. So don't, don't think that because of who you are related to that you don't need to change. Salvation comes one by one, one person at a time. Uh, doesn't, you can't say, well, I'm with that family. God says, no, it's you. I've come to die for you. I love you. So he's warning against this kind of a defensiveness against the message of repentance. And then he says, back to the subject of judgment, he says, and even now the ax is laid to the root of the tree, which does not bear good fruit, is cut down and thrown into the fire. The ax is laid to the root of the trees. In that culture, just like in ours, just as unproductive trees are cut down and burned, so the unfruitful nation of Israel could expect judgment unless they repented, which is exactly what happened. So John really understood that unless a person repented, judgment would come upon them eventually. And he said, even now, the axe is laid to the root of the tree. That axe blade has already hit the bottom of the tree, so the judgment was not too far off from the nation. Well, verse 10 now switches. The people who've been listening to this message, they are affected by it, and they ask. There's three different groups of people who each asked a question of John. Verse 10, so the people asked him, saying, what shall we do then? Well, what should we do? You may be asking yourself this morning as you hear all about this call to repentance and the fact of judgment. You might be asking, what should you do? Well, look what these people. There were three groups. Number, verse 11, he answered and said to them, this would have been just kind of the average common person, if you will, he who has two tunics, and actually it would be the person who has a little more than most, he who has two tunics, and tunics were very valuable in that day, he says, let him give to him who has none, and he who has food, let him do likewise. In other words, what should you do? Stop being selfish and start sharing. Stop being a selfish person and start sharing. That's what you should do. Then the tax collectors also came to be baptized. Now, if there was a group that was hated in Israel, it was the tax collectors. They were Jews who bought a concessionary stand, if you will, from Rome, and they collected taxes for Rome 
They had to give Rome a certain amount, but they had the prerogative to add to the tax whatever they wanted. So naturally, they would up the taxes. They could make up taxes. And, and all of the Jews knew, this is one of our fellow Jewish brothers who is just taking us for a ride financially. They were hated. You know, you know that wee little man Zacchaeus? Do you remember him? He was a tax collector. Remember him? Well, let's sing that song since we've all... There is a song about wee little Zacchaeus. He came down from the tree for Jesus to see. Remember that? That's another story. We'll get to Zacchaeus later on in Luke. The tax collectors, they were coming under conviction. They wanted to know, well, what shall we do? And he said, uh, they, they also came to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than what is appointed for you. In other words, be honest. So to the first group, he said, stop being selfish. Share. Stop being selfish. Second group, stop being crooked. Start being honest. Care and honesty, those are two good things. Verse 14, likewise the soldiers, the Roman soldiers, be like the police, likewise the, the soldiers asked him, saying, and what shall we do? So he said to them a couple of things. Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. So he had three things to say to them. He said, first of all, do not intimidate anyone. Don't intimidate anyone. Never demand or enforce by terrifying people. Soldiers had the power to really enforce people to do things. They could terrify them. And then he said, don't accuse anyone falsely or wrongfully. Don't make up a lie and tell, say that this person did something that they didn't. And then finally, he told them, he said, and be content. They should have been satisfied with their wages and with their allowance. So don't intimidate, don't lie, and be content. So stop being selfish, start caring. Stop being a cheat, be honest. Don't intimidate anyone. Don't lie about anyone and be content. Those are things that people, people could do in response to the uh, message of repentance. Well, let me just say this. Concerning faith and works, which is what we're talking about here, when a person comes to Jesus Christ, this relationship will dramatically transform that person's life you might see a transformation more immediately in the lives of some people than you do others. For example, those whose lives are characterized by pronounced bad habits and blatant immoral living, the change in lifestyle will show others that something profound has indeed happened. They'll just stop living the way that they've been living. For others who've come to Christ, who may not be known for blatantly sinful living, the, the change may not be as outwardly pronounced, but it is just as significant. It's a change. All of us have been separated from God by sin, which was dealt with and atoned for at the cross of Christ. But if you have been converted, your conversion will show itself both in fruit and works. The concept of bearing fruit, he talked about that here, it's often used in Scripture to describe the results of someone's commitment to Christ. If you've committed your life to Christ, there will be fruit. In March of 1978, my wife and I sat in the front row of Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. We were there to see Pastor Chuck Smith to talk about what eventually turned out his leading and direction to us to come to uh, Pixley. We said, no, no, no. He said, okay, how about Visalia? He said, okay. But he taught a message that morning that I, that I can remember to this day. He said, he was teaching out of 2 Corinthians 5, that if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. 
Old things are passed away and all things have become new. I remember I was just sitting, you know, really enjoying the word of God. And he said something like this. He said, if there has been no change, then there has been no change. I thought, well, that's pretty simple, but pretty darn profound. In other words, if you profess to be a Christian, but there's been no change, then there's been no change. Your profession is an empty profession. If you've truly come to Christ, bearing fruit is uh, part of it. If we do not bear fruit, then it is apparent we have not really come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. So you need to ask yourself, is there a change in your life? Does your life reflect that you have changed? Bearing fruit is not an option. It's not just for some people. It is the natural result of a person coming into union with God. Now, if you're sitting here and saying, well, you know what? I don't think there really has been any change. Well, don't get discouraged, but be honest about it and realize, okay, then you need to be saved. Our lives should show that God is at work in our heart. And God desires that we demonstrate our spiritual growth through our outward actions. We must live out our faith. Faith without deeds is incomplete. God has saved you for a purpose. He's planned for you to, to lead a life of good works. And our walk should match our talk. God isn't as concerned with what we say we believe as with how we live what we believe. That's what God is really concerned about. Now in verse 15, is where we will come back to next week. It's where we'll come back to next week. Those of you who are fearful, here's what the book of Hebrews says. Hebrews chapter 9 says this. In verse 27 it says, As it is appointed for men to die once, but after this comes the judgment. What's appointed for you is to die once, and then what's going to come is the judgment. So, if you're afraid of dying and you're not a Christian, you should be because you're headed for the judgment of God. That's what happens to people who are not Christians as they wind up going to the judgment of God. In chapter 10, in verse 31, it says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Verse 30 says, for we know who, him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Sinners will be judged. God will take his vengeance upon sinners. He will repay. That's what he is, a just judge. And so if you're without Christ this morning and you die today, you're going to fall into the hands of the living God who will judge you for your sin. Now, let me just say, what God wants you to do is to fall into his hands today, not after you die. Because if you wait, if you don't fall into his hands today, you'll fall into his hands of judgment. If you fall into his hands today, you're going to fall into the hands of a savior, not a judge. So today he is your savior if you will receive him. If you die without him as your savior, he, you will meet him as your judge. It's up to you. Now, if you're afraid of dying because you're not a Christian, you have good reason to be afraid. I would be afraid too. But if you receive Jesus Christ today, you don't need to worry because you're going to go to heaven. And the Bible says this, that if you will if you will admit that you are a sinner the bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god if you will admit that 
if you will also realize and recognize this, that God is the forgiver. God loves you. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So Christ died for you as a sinner. The book of Acts in chapter 3 says, repent and be converted so that you can be forgiven of your sins. That's your part. God loves you. God is, Christ has died for you. Your part is to turn away from sin and to turn to God and you'll be saved. And then the Bible also says that whoever will call upon the, the Lord will be saved. Whoever will receive him, you'll become his child. John chapter 1 verse 12 says that. So it's up to you today to receive Christ and you'll be saved. So what I'd like to do is to lead us in a prayer of salvation. If you desire to be saved today, I can't save you. All I can do is tell you about Christ. All I can do is lead you to him. It's up to you to receive Jesus Christ into your life. And you are fleeing the wrath to come, and you're fleeing and running right into the arms of your Savior. So would you please join with me? Let's pray if you'll pray out loud with me. Dear God, I admit I'm a sinner. There is no doubt about it. I know it. And I'm sorry for my sin. I don't want to do it anymore. I'm turning to you. I believe in you. I open my heart to you. And I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Forgive me of my sins. I thank you, Jesus. In your name, amen. Let's have the ushers come on up, please, and we'll receive the offering. May I encourage you to join us this Wednesday night. Uh, we're in the book of 1 Corinthians. We just finished the book of Romans, and I have a word of challenge to those of you who, uh, most of you have a DVR or TiVo on your TV, so you can copy whatever you would miss on Wednesday night. Uh, but look, coming to church on Wednesday night is one night out of seven. Now, some of you are not able to come to church on Wednesday night. I understand that. Uh, if you're too old to see well at night, please don't get in your car, okay? Because I might be on the highway. I don't want to run into you. Uh, my wife has trouble seeing at all. That's why I can get away with so much at home. But uh, where did you get that joke anyways? But... Um, if you have nothing else keeping you from coming to church, folks, we're, we're going into the New Testament now. These are beautiful epistles all the way through from 1 Corinthians to the book of Revelation. This place ought to be filled up on Wednesday night. It's starting to fill up. So make a commitment. Come to church. Come and bring your Bibles. Come and hear the word of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We give you your tithes now joyfully in Jesus' name. Amen.